Good morning, everyone. It's Terry Becker. Welcome to our, uh, our webinar today, Arc Flash, Arc Flash Myths and Misinformation. Uh, this is the second webinar that I've provided. I, I finally started to provide webinars uh, to share uh, my knowledge and experience related to Arc Flash and shock hazards, uh, NFPA 70E and CSA Z462, um, using LinkedIn as a medium to get the word out. My, my interpretation, as I said, uh, and information on our flash and shock. And today, this will be probably somewhat controversial, the myths and misinformation that I've been identifying and, and quite vocal, communicating uh, in, in in conferences and, and in, my, in my white papers and uh, articles that I write. So today, we'll do a webinar and discuss specifically arc flash myths and misinformation. So my background, if you're not familiar with me, is I'm an electrical engineer, 30 years experience this year, actually. It was interesting. I graduated from university 30 years ago and started working 14 years specifically devoted to electrical safety. Uh, I'm a founding member and the first past vice chair of the CSA Z462 Workplace Electrical Safety Committee, uh, Tech Committee. I'm currently a voting member and I'm the working group leader for Clause 4.1 uh, and the annexes. I'm also a voting member on Canada's Maintenance of Electrical System Standard, Z463. Uh, and if you were not aware of that, if you are online from Canada, we do have our own maintenance of electrical systems standards at 463 that's equivalent to NFPA 70B in the US. Well, they're, they're quite different and complementary to each other. And so I, I'd recommend that uh, even if you have 70B in the US, you might want to purchase a copy of Z463. I'm also a voting member on the IEEE 1584 uh, Guide for Performing Arc Flash Hazard Calculations Tech Committee. And I've spoken and shared my, again, interpretation and what I've learned about Arc Flash and Shock and 70 and Z462 at conferences and workshops in Canada, the United States, Australia, and I actually presented in India, believe it or not, at an IEEE electrical safety workshop there. I'm the founder of my first company, ESPS Electrical Safety Program Solutions, Inc., and uh, have since then um, sold that company and moved on and currently have my new company, TW Becker Electrical Safety Consulting, Inc. So I, I believe I am a pioneer in electrical safety, specifically electrical safety programs uh, and development and, and getting those uh, into use in the field. My website, uh, twbesc.ca, you can find out more about me and what my company uh, provides for services. Just a little bit of a disclaimer too, that the information I'm providing is an interpretation of my company and myself, and I accept no liability for the information provided uh, and possibly your use of it. Again, we'll go through this though in the myths of misinformation though, like and making decisions uh, and trying to disseminate some of these things using risk assessment tools. So our agenda for today, I'll do a quick poll. And the quick poll is going to be the myths and misinformation that I'm gonna discuss. So we'll see how everybody uh, replies. So it's going to be an anonymous poll that we'll do here right away. I'm going to go through history quickly to sort of frame this topic, then sort of the status quo, get to the myths and information, and have some closing remarks to close off the webinar today, and then uh, Q&A. So again, enter some questions. Um, again, there's a Q&A option and the chat window, so either or, and we'll review those at the end of the webinar. All right. So I'm gonna start the poll and I'll give you all some time to answer these questions. There's 10 questions. So I'm gonna launch the poll and if we could move through this fairly quickly. So try and get through all the questions as quick as you can. Again, um, they're all pretty well true and false. So I'll launch the poll. These will be the myths and misinformation that we'll discuss in today's webinar. So you should see the, the poll show up on your screen. All right, you should all see the poll now. So if you can just go through those questions and just answer them honestly, your, your, your first impression of, of, of your belief or what you heard or what you've been told uh, with respect to the, the question that's asked. Again, there's 10, 10 questions or 10 poll questions that are really stated as what I'll call myths or misinformation. And again, if you can go through those fairly quickly. Again, if you don't want to answer them, you don't have to. Uh, again, I'll just allow everybody to go through those. This will sort of establish the context of our discussion today. So again, if you can move through these as quick as possible.
So I'm just waiting and I'm just assuming everybody, everybody get the poll coming up. Again, I'm not getting any responses back right now. Oh, there we go, perfect. Okay, so just taking a few, a few minutes for the responses to come in. Make sure you read the question clearly uh, before you answer true or false. Already interesting looking at some of the answers. Yeah, I'm not surprised actually, again, is this, and again, this is what we'll review just as we go through this webinar. These are some of the myths and misinformation. This is the short list of the 10 that I'll cover. And I think I have a, a, an 11th one as sort of a stimulating discussion as we get to those slides in the webinar. All right, so we're doing pretty good here. Uh, again, hopefully we can get um, most of the respondents to answer. So I'll keep uh, allowing the poll to run here for a few minutes. Again, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. So I will eventually end the poll with the answers that, uh, that we have coming in. All right, looks pretty good so far. Again, I'll just let it run for maybe another 15 seconds and then I'll stop the poll in the interest of time here so we can keep moving. So again, if I do stop the poll and, and cut you off from answering the questions, I apologize. Again, I just got to keep things moving along. Engaging participation here, looks pretty good. Well, maybe I'll just let it run here. It looks like everybody's working through it. I'll wait just a few, another 15 seconds. Maybe that's about it, maybe. All right, so I'm probably gonna stop the poll. Again, if, you're, if you are going through answering the questions, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop the poll and we'll just go through uh, with the respondents that we have and look at the results. All right, so I've stopped the poll. I'll just share the poll here in a minute. I'm gonna share the results, All right? So you should see a pop-up with the results. So the first question, it is against the law to work on to work on energized electrical equipment. Glad to see that everybody answered that false. It is not against the law. We'll go through that. Testing for absence of voltage doesn't require arc flash shock PP to warn. So the one person said true. Um, the rest said false, right? So that's interesting, right? So again, testing for absence of voltage uh, doesn't require arc flash and shock PP. And it, it does require arc flash and shock PP. Again, that's where the question I hope is not misunderstood. Our company policy says it's dangerous and no PP exists for energized electrical work tasks with greater than 40 calories per centimeter squared arc flash pressure will be extremely high. And then we've got 17, 18% said true and 82% and said false. Again, so that's another interesting one. I'm the president of my electrical contracting company. I emailed a policy to all workers that we will not work live. We really don't need any of this. Gross negligence or willful misconduct. And it's interesting that 65% know on that said no on that because it is gross negligence and willful misconduct for the president of that electrical contracting company to make that statement and wrongly assume um, that they don't need any of this arc flash and shock PP and training and procedures. All energized electrical equipment is apparently high likelihood of having an arcing fault and create an, creating an arc flash. Again, that's interesting. Again, we have a split there, but 80% said false and 18% said true. Operating energized electrical equipment requires full body arc flash PP worn at all times. Again, we've got and it's almost like an 80 20 split there. If I go in the electrical room, I need full body arc flash. Great to see that that's a false statement. Everybody agreed with that one. The door on the electrical room indicates arc flash and shock hazards. I need full body arc flash and shock PP. Again, we had several that said true. And again, that's on the door of the electrical room, right? Going into the electrical room. Uh, nine, the equipment label for arc flash and shock is on the electrical equipment. The arc flash boundary is real right now. That is really interesting. We had a 50-50 split there. And again, that's that's not true as well. It's work task dependent uh, if the arc flash boundary would be real or not, not just because the label's on the electrical equipment. Opening a hinge door on energized electrical equipment is 100% probability of an arcing fault and arc flash. And this one is interesting with the split between 65 and 35. So Again, we'll go through these myths and we'll hopefully stimulate some Q and A's at the end of the webinar. So I'm gonna stop the share 
and I'll move into the PowerPoint. So very interesting. Again, um, thank you for answering those questions. And again, just take those into context as we go through the rest of the webinar. So again, just history, arc flash and electric shock. So two identified hazards, right? Shock is relatively easy to identify, exposed conductors and circuit parts, inadvertent movement into those conductors circuit parts and momentary or heaven forbid, longer term contact, current flows to the body, uh, pain, and again, depending on the amount of current, the time and the path, uh, heart fibrillation and electrocution. Arc flash is where the concern is. You have to have an abnormal arcing fault. Uh, again, this abnormal condition, abnormal arcing fault and electrical equipment, the voltage has to be high enough to sustain that arcing fault. We need available fault current and the protective device clearing time needs to be taken into consideration as well with respect to one, the, in, the arc flash occurring, and then the resulting in synergy. Primary injuries burns to the skin, but then there's other uh, secondary effects of arc flash. The one that's most significant and relates to myths is the arc flash pressure, which we'll discuss. So historically abnormal arcing faults and arc flashes have not been identified in the workplace. They don't occur frequently. And that's why it just really hasn't been identified and on the radar screen, specifically in Canada until we had CSA Z462 workplace electrical safety standard published uh, based on NFPA 70E. And the same thing with NFPA 70E, it really didn't start to really flag arc flash until probably the 2004 edition, right? So again, 70E was initially focusing on the NEC and shock and then evolved to arc flash uh, and then included arc flash content in the original hazard risk category tables. And then the IEEE 1584 published in 2002, but arc flash has taken over the narrative and since my involvement for 14 years, there's a lot of, again, myths and misinformation that I've been talking about that we're going to discuss today. Again, we've got to manage arc flash. We've got to put more emphasis on the shock hazard. So electrical incident statistics help us in trying to rationalize this, this discussion as well. So this is a report that was published in 2015 by the Fire Protection Research Foundation, a uh, partnership between NFPA and UL. And they took all sorts of incident statistics, electrical incident statistics in the US, amalgamated into one report. And really, I just highlighted one element of this report, but they looked at fatalities due to electrical incidents. 5,567 fatalities in 20 years, 99% were electrocution. So relatively speaking, there's an electrocution occurring every day in the US. Um, Canada would not have the same statistics. But as far as arc flash burns, and again, a worker having a fatal injury, probably one a year, two a year. Uh, again, an arc flash burn, or again, there's probably no arc flash PP worn, uh, significant burn injury, third degree, and the worker didn't survive. So statistics help us understand and clarify the narrative and with the myths and misinformation and when we do a risk assessment related to energized electrical work tasks. Now, there's no specific data here about physical trauma or death due to arc flash pressure. Right. So again, one element of distilling the myths and misinformation is statistics. Now, again, also what's happened is the C code and the NEC included a minimum label requirement. And in Canada, we had the cart before the horse. We had this rule come into the 2006 Canadian electrical code and no one even knew what an arc flash was. And this is really when I discovered arc flash was in 2004 and 2005. I went to the IEEE PCIC conference and there was a presentation on the 2004 edition of 70, but I came back to Canada, did a little bit of homework, and here we were going to have a rule added to the Canadian Electrical Code 2006 edition that had this minimal arc flash and shock hazard label. And the U.S., it's just a minimal arc flash hazard label. I also, you know, discovered that there's a rule in the Canadian Electrical Code, Rule 2304 disconnection, and it's again, it's a it's an OHNS, OHNS rule and a safe installation standard, and that rule in Canada has led to some of the myths. The first myth which is it's against the law to work energized. And this has been you know, miscommunicated by both the OHNS regulator and the jurisdiction having responsibility for the CE code part one. So this is the rule. And again, you got to read it. No repairs or alterations shall be carried out on live equipment except where complete disconnection of the equipment's not feasible. It doesn't say it's against the law. And then appendix B specifically says, reference the CSA Z462 workplace electrical safety standard. Right, so then Canada, this rule over the last decade has been communicated by the regulator. And I'll show you some examples coming up when we review the myths. And then industry interprets that as, and specifically electrical workers. 
So I've come across electrical workers that are saying, hey, I could lose my ticket. I could use my livelihood because it's against the law. I'm being pulled by the regulator and the employer needs to manage that myth. We need electrical workers to be confident that they can work energized, that they can do energized electrical work. It's not against the law, right? So this rule in Canada has been one of the biggest problems with miscommunicating that it's against the law to work energized, as well as the OHS regulations. So back to the history again, Electric Shock, American Electrician's Handbook. I actually have the, the 1953 version here, right? And I didn't believe this when I saw it, but it was published from 1942 to 1960. And this is part of the, the history and why electrical workers have accepted being shocked and, and why it hasn't been reported. They haven't reported being shocked. They accepted it, right? And in this, in this handbook, it, the human body uses a voltage detector up to 250 volts AC, use your fingers, and then stick the bell and signal wiring in your mouth and taste electricity. It's actually laughable, but it, it was taught, right? So again, we've got this history with shock and the workers haven't, haven't reported it. It was right of a passage and accepted as part of the job. But what's been happening, at least in Canada, because in Canada, each province is regulated separately under oh &S regulations. We have a federal Canada Labor Code Part 2 for federally regulated employers, including the government. But each province then has its own oh &S regulations. So I was really pleased when in British Columbia, the Technical Safety BC, the jurisdiction for enforcing the Canadian Labor Code Part 2 in the province of British Columbia, did a shock report, you know, shock study and a report based on incident statistics. And again, it flagged that the shocks are happening, unfortunately, the electrocutions, right? And that really the arc flash hazards weren't there. So they did a study, they did some interviewing of electrical workers and their field safety representatives. And this is on their website. And again, so it put emphasis on shock and pushed down that arc flash narrative, all right? And why workers are working energized. Again, risk factors, societal, sexual, organizational, interpersonal and individual. So it's a good, a, a good study about why, work, why workers work energized. And the bottom line is because we need them to. We need them to do energized electrical work, not only journeyman, journey personal electricians, but other task qualified workers, HVAC techs, a, you know, a, a, overhead door and crane mechanics, elevator mechanics, right? Cathodic protection techs. So there's workers that we need to do energized work, diagnostics and troubleshooting and isolation related. We want to eliminate the repair and alteration, but with the miss and misinformation, we're going to, I think, when we are creating an environment where workers are just plain going to refuse, and I don't know how we're going to manage, you know, that environment. So one other thing that I've been putting a lot of focus on in the last year is sequela related to electric shock. So specifically, I was contacted by an electrician in Edmonton, Alberta, John Knoll, um, through the Electrical Contract Association of Alberta, who I've been working with for a long time. And John said, you've been talking about shock. And I remember you mentioned the sequela. And I said, yeah, I did. But I hadn't put a lot of emphasis on it. So John Noel has sequela and he's suffering from multiple sequelae. So again, I'm, I'm using this webinar today to talk about this topic, to change the narrative, get the topic of shock on top of the table and arc flash below it or beside it at least. So sequela is a medical term for a secondary effect of a primary exposure, right? The primary exposure shock and then these secondary effects are sequela or sequelae, and these are potentially in this laundry list is all true. So if an electrical worker has been shocked multiple times, right, they may have sequela and sequelae, which is multiple effects, psychological, neurological, and physical symptoms. And again, I'm just bringing folks and attention this webinar. Believe it or not, there is a Canadian hospital and research center at the Sunnybrook Health and Sciences Center. They have an electrical injury program. It's been there for over a decade. Initially, it was Dr. Joel Fish, and then that's been taken over by Dr. Jeske now. So in Canada, we've actually had research into electrical injury for quite some time again, but no profile, no awareness. So my, my future goal is to keep this at the top, right, of my communication. Uh, again, on LinkedIn and papers, and again, sequela. And I will be presenting a paper, a poster paper session with John Knoll at the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop 2022 in Jacksonville. So we need this topic to be more front and center and we need arc flash to be pushed down. Again, they're both real hazards, but they need to be, you know, properly leveraged. And again, these myths and misinformation need to be managed. So believe it or not, at the University of Chicago, there's a Chicago Electrical Trauma Rehabilitation Institute, CETRI, and they've been doing research into shock as well. But not a lot of notoriety. So if you're involved in electrical safety, let's spread the word about shock. Let's spread the word about sequela and let's get electrical workers the treatment they need. 
they may have these long-term effects that they equate to old age or, or you know, health issues, hereditary, or that they just have occurred in their lives. But in reality, it's sequela. All right, there's actually some really good websites when you dig down into this. So this is the Journal of Neuropsychiatry. And there's two parts to this. There's an electrical injury part one with that website link on mechanisms and then consequences. And it's, this is, the, believe it or not, the study that's been done has been quite amazing about, again, shock and, and the long-term effects and how it occurs uh, with, again, multiple shocks and current flow through the human body. So as well, John Knowles' research actually found a paper in the province of Alberta published in 2013, but there was no notoriety, no awareness. And then long-term effects of electric shock exposure. All right, this paper is a great summary by this Dr. Wesner. Um, again, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada in 2013. And the problem is without the shocks reported, workers' compensation claims you can't get, you can't get workers' comp, right? So we need workers' compensation boards. We need doctors to be aware of sequela so that if workers report shocks and there's a WC report and they have long-term effects that they can get insurance if they can no longer work or their work is debilitated and what they can perform as far as you know the electrical work they were doing. So we need shock and sorry, electric shock sequela and sequelae to be uh, communicated broadly, as broadly as arc flash unfortunately has been, right? But the challenge is there's no great videos to show, right? Thankfully, right? And, and other means of, of that, that arc flash has taken over the narrative, right? So just quickly, the evolution of Z462 and 70E, we're, we're starting to get some divergence between the two in the 2021 editions. Again, so just an FYI, and if you want to talk about that more, you can get in touch with me. Um, I do have a changes and updates document for Z462 and can discuss the changes and differences between those two standards. So again, great documents, and they have made a big difference. Z462 in Canada definitely has, I know 70E has, and will continue to, and then internationally. 70E has a presence uh, globally as well. There really is no other document like NFPA 70E, and that's why we adopted it in Canada. Uh, again, but we have you know put our own flair on it. We've added additional annexes that aren't in 70E, and again, some of the the clause to article content is not 100% uh, convergent. But again, the core technical requirement is. Now, with respect to to, to risk assessment. Again, this is, this is a powerful tool that can help you disseminate the myths and misinformation that we're going to review and that you answered in the poll, right? So qualitative risk assessment, use this tool to make decisions, understand the context of the work task, be realistic, do not be conservative, use statistics and other information and experience, right? And experience when you do these risk assessments. And I recommend work task-based risk assessments using NFPA 70 table 130.5C, or CSA Z462 Table 2, there's 31 work tasks. 70 and Z462 are work tasks based and use risk assessment. I've, I've shown a three by three electrical hazard risk assessment matrix. This is the risk assessment matrix that I use when I work with clients in the electrical safety program that I deploy. And we do again, a qualitative risk assessment. We have a risk register table. We risk those work tasks and we determine in a committee right, what the residual risk level would be with the application of the hierarchy of risk control methods. So this tool can be used to disseminate the myths and misinformation that I'm communicating today. Again, that you started with in the poll, and then I'm briefly going to review here shortly. The other challenge is the calculations by PE or PNG engineers. So I have had the luxury because of my consultancy and working with clients across Canada and some with facilities in the U.S. to review these reports from multiple firms one man, one person, mid-sized and large national or North American firms. And I'm sad. It's, it's really quite sad as an electrical engineer myself that I, I drop my jaw when I look at some of these reports. The report quality is unbelievably poor. The information that's presented is not detailed enough. Sometimes I, I, I've got a report that's like two pages. Then I'll have a report that's like 800 pages. It swings. Right, so it's really not a real good reflection of my profession, unfortunately. So there's lots of errors and omissions related to arc blast pressure and miscommunication historically. The reports included HRC numbers or CAT numbers or level letters with respect to the reporting out of required arc flash PP when really the reporting of arc flash PP should not have even been included in the engineer's report. Right, so that's a whole other topic of discussion. This report that's issued is a technical report that should report incident energy at the working distance and the arc flash boundary. 
and it shouldn't go on exhaustively both PPE and, and, and they did. And they included, you know, HRC you know, one through four or category one through four now. And I've even seen reports with level letters invented level A, B, C, D, E, and equating it to, uh, again, an ARC thermal performance value reported out in the results table. So again, lots of misinformation really in these engineers reports that's also deep dived industry into some of these myths and misinformation, specifically BLAST, and then miscommunicating PPE. PPE is called up with an HRC two or four or a category two or four or a, like that level A on, and it's because this information, these reports is what the client received and the equipment labels included that information. All right, so what's happened is the new formulas, the 2018 edition, Again, it's been out a couple of years now, this fall. And I, I again, I, I'm, I'm a one person consultancy and there's literally thousands of consulting firms across North America, you know, doing these studies from scratch or redoing them now. And I think, and forgive me, but I can be critical of my profession. There's a lot of, of problems and misinformation still going out to the client base for redoing the calculations to the new formulas and a conservative assessment of the parameters and putting a cost burden on the client that right now with the economy, especially in Canada, they can't afford, right? And again, the labels still coming out with non-compliant labels. So, and a lot of the consultants, I do ask when I get the opportunity, are you aware of IEEE 1584.1? The guide for the specification scope and deliverable requirements for an arc flash hazard calculation study in accordance with 1584, the image on the bottom right. And I'd say, I'd say 90% of the engineers that I asked that question do not know that 1584-1 exists. And it's an amazing document. In fact, it tells the engineer exactly how to do this study in steps and gives some interpretation information. But I still, even on top of that, see that there will continue to be, unfortunately, misinformation provided to clients and poor quality or non-compliant labels provided as part of these reports. So this is an example of a non-compliant label and the reason is it states policy and information on the label that it shouldn't. Ince Energy is at this location, dangerous exceeds the max safe working level, energized work is not recommended. This is not up to the engineer to decide on policy. The employer is responsible for the workplace, not the PN doing an IEEE 1584 report. So I've seen this label with this type of quotation on it in multiple formats. Dangerous, no PP exists, no energized work is authorized. Right. This is a non-compliant label. This information shouldn't be on this label again. And it says danger in the signal pan. This is my opinion, not compliant to ANSI Z535. Again, um, one example, and I've only got this one example, and I'm going to show you a compliant label. This compliant label, visually very easy to see the ANSI energy level on the left-hand side and the voltage on the right. And it says reference company electrical safety program for arc flash PP requirements. And that's where the PP should be stipulated by the employer. They specify it in their electrical safety program. They procure it and provide it to the qualified electrical workers. The label should not stipulate any specific arc flash PP. I've also seen labels with a full list of PP on it that shouldn't be on the label. The engineer does not know what the employer has procured and the engineer is not responsible for what the employer procures. The report should just have incident energy at the working distance and the arc flash boundary calculated. And if the client asks for it, instant energy reduction options and realistic instant energy reduction options. I've, again, I keep it, well, we're going to try and get to eight calories. Well, good luck, right? So I think that that also is something that the PE or PN should not communicate to the client and spend a ton of money, right? Because technically infeasible and cost prohibitive, right? To even attempt to get to eight calories. So I balance out the target instant energy level. And right now I balance it out to recommending a 75 calorie per centimeter squared arc flash suit. And I try to get to 75 cals or less and balancing out again, engineering safety by design and substitution, technical feasibility and the application and use of PP. PP performance is the same, whether it's 8.0 or 75.0 calories per centimeter squared, as far as the residual burn injury probability. So a compliant label, this one has a maintenance mode switch in the bottom in the signal pan, sorry, at the bottom in the, in the footer. And the footer is where I see a lot of non-compliance in these labels. It, it doesn't clearly indicate to the qualified electrical worker where the instant energy value is, right? So it's the footer on the label format based on the one that I just showed you and another label with it where it says arc flash relay on in the footer. And then the danger signal pan label, technically 
would be at 140 calories. And there's a bit of a typo at the top. It, it should be 140.1 calories in the label because greater than 140.1, we don't have our, our flash shoot available. So just the typo at the top it says why at 143 and it should, the label should say 143. So just clarifying that 140.0 or greater instant energy danger signal pad, technically no arc flash PP. So here's some of the myths that I again went through in the poll. It's against the law to work energized. That's not true. Uh, testing for absence of voltage doesn't require arc flash and shock PP. That's not true. The qualified electric worker needs arc flash and shock PP until they establish an electrically safe work condition, until they prove absence with an approved test instrument. Myth three, our company policy says it's dangerous and no PEP exists for energized work tasks with greater than 40 calories per centimeter squared of instant energy. Our flash pressure will be extremely high, right? And again, this, was, this has been communicated for over a decade and it's not true. Arc flash PP is available at 140 calories. Instant energy doesn't correlate to arc blast pressure. Risk assessment procedure will assist an employer in proving this out. So myth one, again, it's against the law to work energized. This is some of the specific uh, regulatory information that's come out in Canada that's again been misunderstood by industry. So in, in BC, uh, this was brought out when it was BCSA, which is now Technical Safety British Columbia, and it's a directive related to the C code rule 2304. So it places emphasis and focus on it, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, what it does is confuse industry and it gets electrical workers to believe, oh my God, it's against the law. And it's not, it's misinterpreted. It does focus attention. It does reference Z462. There's an, another element, another document related to this directive. Ultimately, an employer's electrical safety program is how you would solve all of these myths is with an electrical safety program with a risk assessment procedure and a risk matrix and, and a qualitative risk assessment process. In Ontario, the Electrical Safety Authority, their website, again, Rule 2304. Now, this is where, it, again, this language, the Ontario Electrical Safety Code, Rule 2304, disconnection stipulates that no repairs or alterations shall be carried out on energized electrical equipment and that adequate precautions such as locks on circuit breakers and switches, warning signs, it shall be taken. So it says, you shall not do energized repair alteration. The rule doesn't say that. I, I, the C code rule above I showed you, it doesn't say that. Now on the Ontario Electrical Safety Code, I have to check and see if they altered rule 2304. Again, I haven't done that recently. So in Canada, the, the provincial jurisdiction for the C code part one can take deviations and publish amendments. So if they amended it and added in the word repair or alteration, and I think the previous wording in rule 2304 had those words in it, so they're basically saying it's against the law to do repair or alteration energized. And it's, it's not true. And well, in Ontario, they're saying that it is. And then again, the workers go, it's against the law and I'm going to lose my ticket, right? Z462 and 70E allow energized electrical work, either diagnostics or repair, but an energized electrical work permit would be required for the repair. In Ontario as well, under the Construction Safety Association, in, in partnership with the Ministry of Labor, who regulates OHS regulations and on province of Ontario, they put out this health and safety advisor working live. The following are the only circumstances when working or near exposed parts or electrical equipment is permitted. According to section 191 of the construction regulation in Ontario regulation 213.91, when diagnostic testing is to be carried out, when it's not reasonably possible to disconnect the equipment installation or conductor from the power supply before working on or near the exposed parts, or when the equipment installation or conductor is rated 600 volts or less, and if disconnecting the power would create a greater hazard to a worker than proceeding without disconnecting it. So this language sort of aligns with Z462 and 70E with respect to justification for energized electrical work. All right. So, and it's interesting, again, the Ontario Ministry of Labor does not consider the disruption of normal building operations or any increased expenses associated with providing temporary power to be an acceptable reason for saying it's not reasonably possible to de-energize the system. Inconvenience in the client does not qualify as a situation where it's not reasonably possible to energize the system. So I do like the language that we need to, in this case, a contractor, work with the client to say, when can we turn the power off, right? Do we need to work off hours? It might cost us some extra money because it's overtime, but we can do it if we change again the mentality of the client and then get the workers to work off hours, right? So again, miscommunication through these regulatory rules. Now, this is WorkSafe BC. Again, which is the regulator for the OHS regulations in BC and their rule 19.10, low voltage electrical equipment must be completely disconnected and locked out as required by this regulation before start working on it. But you've got to read the rest of the rule. 
except as specified in subsection three, if it's not practicable to completely disconnect low voltage electrical equipment, work must be performed by qualified and authorized workers in accordance with the written safe work procedures, which require the use of PPE and voltage rated tools appropriate to the hazards and risks associated with the voltage at which the electrical equipment's operating. So you got to read the regulations and interpret them appropriately. And then my opinion is through an electrical safety program with a defined risk assessment procedure, you're the employer takes control. So myth number three, with respect to the 40 Cal myth, this relates to original research by Dr. Ralph Lee. This was published back in the late 1980s. He's a PhD electrical engineer from Edmonton, Alberta. And back in the late 1980s, he was one of the, you know, one of the, the, the forefathers of, of formulas to calculate instant energy and the arc flash boundary and blast pressure. And really no research has, has technically has been completed. IEEE 5094 has still not done detailed research on blast pressure, but this is the graph that stipulates that blast pressure correlates to abnormal arcing fault current, not incident energy. There's no direct correlation between blast pressure and incident energy, right? So doesn't correlate. Distance and arcing fault current determine arc flash pressure, not incident energy level. So again, there's no correlation to this 40 cal value for cutoff. And over time, there used to be a note in 70 and Z462 that said if it's 40 calories, and it was never substantiated, so they deleted it. Someone put a public comment and said, there's no substantiation, get that out of there. And it was removed because it wasn't substantiated. And this graph substantiates that there's no correlation between incident energy and blast pressure. All right, so again, arcing fault current percentage of available fault current. So the arcing fault current will be less than the maximum available fault current or the short circuit current. There's no document evidence of fatalities. And that statistic report that I brought up earlier, right? Inherent and residual risk related to blast should be physical trauma, repairable injury. Right, repairable injury residually with respect to the potential severity of injury or damage to health when you complete your risk assessment. Again, myth three, there's no PP that exists. Here's two examples of PP that does exist. It's existed for quite some time. This is Oberon Company's ARC 100 or their true color gray 100 ARC flash suit, 106 calories per centimeter squared, and their 140 calorie per centimeter squared ARC flash suit. These, these ARC flash suits have been around for over a decade, probably, I think, 15 years when I got into this way back then. Eventually, I found out that this existed, and this PP performs the same as the shirt that I'm wearing. It performs the same as the shirt that I'm wearing, right, as far as 50% probability of the onset of a secondary burn injury, all right? So this PP performs the same as the PP that you see on the screen. So myth four, I'm the president of my electrical contacting company. I mail out the workers. We don't work live here. We don't need any of this. That's negligent. That's negligent. And, and I, you know, every electrical worker owns a digital multimeter. Every electrical worker does voltage measurements and that's energized electrical work. Myth five, all energized electrical equipment is apparently high leg of having an abnormal arcing fault. And I don't know how we've arrived at this. It's not true. And again, the condition of maintenance needs to be assessed with respect to the risk assessment procedure. But for some reason, we're just believing that, well, we didn't do any maintenance in three years. Uh, it's, 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 it's the abnormal arcing fault, 100% probability right? It's, this is not true. Myth six, operating energized electrical room wires, full body arc flash BB to one at all times, operating it, turning it on and off, right? And this is also not true. But inherently now I, I, I come into a consultancy with a company for a program. They go, well, we're wearing arc flash PP, full body to operate. I'm going, why? How, how can the abnormal arcing fault occur? Have you not done any maintenance for 20, 30, 40 years? Well, no, no, we do maintenance. Right? So why do we believe that manufacturers of electrical equipment provide us equipment that is inherently 100% failure rate coming out of factory? It's not true. So and subjectively, you have to manage your interpretation of maintenance and not be conservative, right? So here's operating energized electrical equipment, standing to the side, opening and closing a circuit breaker, using a keypad, right? I'm operating that VFD, I'm turning it on and off, right? Panel boards, right? You know, opening and closing circuit breakers, uh, again, operating electrical equipment and opening up panel dead front. Do we need arc flash PP for that? No. And again, you know, wall mounted VFD and, you know, isolating the drive. We don't need full arc flash PP. Simple procedure, stand to the side. There's no left hand rule. Look away and don't hold your breath and switch the disconnect or circuit breaker. Under normal equipment conditions, no arc flash PP is required. If I go into the electrical room, I need full body arc flash PP born just to go in. That's also false, right? That is not true. 
The door on the electrical room indicates arc flash and shock has, I need arc flash and shock PP. Well, not true. It's work task. It's the work task. And again, your electrical has an identification for abnormal arcing fault, voltage is high enough to sustain, right? Fault currents available. And then we can have an arc flash, shock exposed conductors and circuit parts, right? So again, labeling on doors, labeling on electrical equipment, other labels I've seen, you know, uh, recently I was just this week, actually I got this label and, and I was asked, is this label okay? And the label said that it wasn't authorized to, to you know, to open equipment or arc flash PP on a generic vendor label. The vendor does not determine the policy. Your company's electrical safety program and your risk assessment determines if your specific electrical equipment poses an abnormal arcing fault probability of yes and an arc flash hazard to workers. And then the shock hazard if they open it up and go in and there's exposed conductors and circuit parts. Myth nine, the equipment label for arc flash and shock is on the electrical equipment. The arc flash boundary is real right now. That's also not true. Companies, oh, we're going to point, we want to paint lines on uh, yellow lines on the floor for the arc flash boundary. We can have lines all over the place because the arc flash boundary is not the same on every piece of electrical equipment. So the arc flash boundary only exists when the work task that will be performed on the electrical equipment would indicate that we could have an abnormal arcing fault. So again, it's the label is, means nothing until the work task that's going to be completed would again create the potential, uh, the like of occurrence, yes, of an abnormal arcing fault. All right. So the equipment labels hazard information that's applied against, again, a risk assessment procedure. And when a qualified person or what I call qualified electrical worker uh, gets a job and discrete work tasks assigned to them, then they look at the discrete work tasks. I use what I call an energized electrical job workflow. It's a flow chart to aid the worker in understanding Again, when they need to identify when they're exposed and a work task table, a work task table that they can reference. Myth 10, opening a hinge door on energized electrical equipment, 100% probability of arcing fault and arc flash occurring. So this is a one that really concerns me because in NFPA 70 table 130.5C and Z462 table two, there's a work task that combines opening a hinge door and removing a bolt on cover and for any equipment condition, it says likely of an abnormal arc fault, yes. And those work task tables need to be reviewed by the user, by the employer, and you need to change the work task descriptions if you're going to use them because they're not all correct and they're conservatively assessed. That doesn't give you any information on the type of electrical equipment that the hinge door is on or the voltage. And I'll quote that opening hinge doors when you have a normal electrical equipment condition right, for low voltage equipment specifically, right, doesn't pose an abnormal arcing fault and an arc flash exposure to the worker under normal equipment conditions. So again, we're debilitating electrical workers, we're removing confidence from them, they're very doubtful now, and that just increases likelihood of occurrence of the actual incident exposure, because with respect to like of occurrence, we need the worker to be qualified, competent, and their human performance to be normal, and then the condition of maintenance assessed. But if we have an impact on human performance, there's a lack of confidence, uncertainty. I'm going to lose my ticket. I don't know. Uh, how come you know, I can't open hinge doors on this control panel with a full arc flash PPE? You've got to substantiate these myths and tamper them through your electrical safety program and a defined risk assessment procedure and use an electrical hazard risk matrix and risk register table. Do a qualitative risk assessment. Don't be conservative manage the subjectiveness of us, or we're going to continue going down what I call these rabbit holes, and we're going to keep digging deeper and deeper. And eventually, electrical workers will raise their hands up in the air and go, I'm not going to be in this trade anymore. I can't even do my job, right? And, and they'll have a lack of confidence. They'll be fearful. And I do see a lot of fear-based training over the last decade, showing videos and distilling the fear of God in electrical workers attending training does nothing, does nothing for industry, does nothing for the worker. Right? So that's the other reason a lot of these myths and misinformation um, are occurring. So here's one for you too, that, that's going to be a future myth. 240 volt single phase can sustain an abnormal arcing fault and become an arc flash. Unfortunately, in CSA Z462, uh, this is one of the divergences in the 2021 edition. We added an alternate arc flash PP category table, and it's in a normative annex, annex V, and it's table V1, and 
I did not agree with this. I voted against it. There was no substantiation. IEEE 1584 only applies to 28 volt three phase up to 15 kV three phase. And there's no credible technical peer reviewed substantiation. So this is another new myth. All right. Again, another new myth that we'll add to the list and see how this pans out over the next year or two. All right. Because I'm telling you, if, if, <laughs> if, if they do do the research and this pans out, we've got other, other issues. But again, from what I've seen in my travels, attending conferences and, and you know, on the internet and, and looking for information, this is not true. But we unfortunately have this new table V1 and Z462, which would imply that it is true. And I battled it and I disagreed and I was voted against and it was accepted. So, and that's, this is not in 70E. We do only have the original table um the arc flash pp category table in 70e this is a technical divergence in z462 that this alternate table which was meant to be easier for the user based on nameplate data to select an arc flash pp category but it included a row now that says 240 volt single phase could sustain and i totally disagree with it so just closing remarks and again um i, I see some q a's coming in so if if i've stimulated some questions um, enter them in the Q&A and I'll try and address some of them. So we need to control myths and misinformation with and with your employees. If you if you are a person that that is an end user, if you're an engineer doing studies, you need to make sure your studies are realistic. Do not be conservative, right? Do not misinform the client and do not report any information report that doesn't need to be there. The other reason you don't want to put any information on PP in your report is you're accepting liability. You're not getting compensated for. So keep to the facts in your reports. If you're an engineer that does these studies, if you're the employer or representing the employer as a, as a maintenance you know, manager or electrical worker or an electrical engineer, you need to get a handle on these myths and misinformation and the companies that have been promoting them to you, which could be a consultant, could be an equipment manufacturer, maybe a PP vendor, right? Um, again, you have to manage this information, ask questions and get substantiation from the instructor and trainer. There's a thousand people doing arc flash training and I don't know how employers can just hire someone and not say, why are you an SME? What makes you a subject matter expert on NFPA 70 years at 462, right? And the company that you work for, you've got to make sure that the company you hire for the training can substantiate the information that they train to and that they are not misinforming your employees, right? Again, the reports, the arc flash hazard and surgeon analysis reports, the engineer needs to provide full substantiation in the report. If it's not there, ask them. Ask them for detailed explanation of all the parameters and why they selected them in IEEE 1584 and get them to substantiate why they selected a certain parameter. And if it's providing high energy values, ask them, well, why did we use that information? You know, and, and understand, and that's a challenge. A lot of companies that are hiring engineers don't have someone that's maybe gonna ask and, and they just accept the report and then, oh my God, right? Dangerous and, you know, so, Again, that's another challenge where there isn't anybody working for the client that can challenge the PE or the PNG. And again, I've seen, like I said, so many reports that I just shake my head. Really, I'm embarrassed actually with some of the reports I've seen and reviewed. And I do follow up with those engineers. And I, I think when I follow up with them, because under the code of ethics, I have to, that I get deer in the headlights because they really don't maybe care, right? Well, it's just this one engineer and it's one client, you know, no big deal. Unfortunately, that needs to change. Engineers need to review these reports and the analysis and make sure that they can substantiate. IEEE 1584.1 is amazing. And then the PP vendor, ask them for substantiation as well. Use a specification when you procure arc flash and shock PP, tell them what you want and then get them to tell you what they have and that it is compliant PP, right? And most of the vendors in North America, they are, right? They're good vendors, but it's maybe uh, not directly the, the, the PP vendor or the, the fabricator, the manufacturer. It's a third party representative that may give you misinformation, all right? So ask for the facts, get directly back to the original manufacturer, right? And get the facts about arc flash PP as well, all right? And in the engineer's report, if there's information on PP, disregard it. Get your own information on the PP, but ultimately through your company's electrical safety program is where you will document your policies, practices, and procedural requirements and take control of all of this. So you need to ensure you manage the myths and misinformation. And I've just quoted 10 and we can embellish on some of them, right, as well. Develop an implement compliant electrical safety program. Use risk assessment as a valuable tool. Yes, ensure energized work tasks are justified are performed. 
want to eliminate repair and alteration. We definitely want to eliminate energized repair and alteration work tasks, but they are still justified. You just need an energized electrical work permit. And again, make sure your, your justification can be validated if there is an incident, right? So 70 and Z462 allow energized diagnostics and energized repair. For the repair, you need a permit. And we could talk about the energized electrical work permit quite some too, sometime too. It's been misinterpreted and misapplied. Don't get confused or be confused. U70E and Z462 has tools, their toolboxes, reasonable and practical interpretation of their requirements and deviate, take deviations and interpret and, and again, add to the information that's presented. It isn't necessarily correct, right? Do not be too conservative with respect to arc flash. And I'm going to say it, we need more focus on the electric shock hazard statistically that's where the, there's shocks happening literally thousands today in North America and at least one electrocution, if not two. And maybe there's arc flashes happening, but not at that level of frequency. And again, the fatalities due to arc flash might be one uh, year in the US and in Canada, probably one in five years or more, tough statistic. But from what I've reviewed, that would be realistic for Canada. Our population is less than the US. Manage residual risk. So when you do your risk assessment procedure, identify with the hierarchy of risk controls, the controls the worker needs to apply to achieve a residual risk level as low as reasonably practicable. But we need documentation. So in the electrical safety program that I develop, I have an energized electrical job safety planning form. I've had it for probably a decade. We need to give the worker tools that they can use to apply the training. There's tons of training happening. Workers are doing what I call bottom-up control, sending their workers on training, buying the Mark Flash and Shock PP and getting a study done rather than starting from the top down, which is define an electrical safety program, our policies, our practice and procedural requirements, right? And then control through risk assessment, the hierarchy of risk controls after that, right? So develop and implement an electrical safety program with a detailed risk assessment procedure and field-based documentation for the worker that they can fill out. Historic arc flash and shock hazards were not identified. Electric shock sequela. I've made a point in this webinar today about the long-term effects of shock that are not understood, and we need to pay attention. We need to get the word out to industry. We need, again, the community of healthcare givers to understand that there is these long-term effects and throughout North America and globally. Because remember, this is a global issue shocks, electrocutions, and arc flash. And there's literally going to be hundreds of thousands of electrical workers that have sequela and do not know because their physicians don't know. So we need to get that word out and manage that and help these workers that have these long-term effects. We need to be, you know, identify arc flash and shock hazards legitimately against jobs assigned to workers and discrete work tasks that they'll perform underneath those jobs. Manage again the misinformation and miss. Understand what energized electrical work tasks will expose a worker. What work task specifically? opening a hinge door, operating a circuit breaker. It's unbelievably conservative to believe that we need full arc flash PP to go into an electrical room, walk around in there, right? Operate electrical equipment, the interface with an HMI. It's just, it's ridiculous actually, right? But I'm walking into clients where they're, they're, they're gone down that rabbit hole from training or information in the studies. Again, you got to manage these myths and misinformation. We need the worker to have confidence. Take control of arc flash. As the employer, do not be again manipulated by all the information that's out there, the videos and the information in the report, and it's just it's overwhelming, and that's another challenge. Is just all this information on our flash, and and again, the the, the myths and misinterpretation I presented today just have exasperated this, and it's it's debilitating industry, and it's again it's not instilling confidence, it's causing workers to to increase the lack of exposure because their performance is going to go down. Substantiate information you hear, get the facts, do not be conservative, manage subjective decisions, be practical, use statistics, and still confidence and certainty with workers, not fear, right? Place more emphasis on shock, ensure we understand electric shock sequela. All right, so just to close things off again, my company does electrical safety consulting, and I'm trying to help employers bridge this gap, deal with these myths and misinformation, and get those taken care of with a compliant electrical safety program. So implement a compliant program, train your staff, but make sure your training is compliant, not fear-based, fact-based. This is what Z462 and 70 tell us to do, and these are tools that you can use. 
deploy again. And then what I'm now promoting is deploying an electrical safety program with web-based OHS software and a phone application. So all the forms can be filled out because the phone, the paperwork burden, Terry, it's a lot of paperwork. Well, we can out and digitally manage the paperwork with online deployment of an electrical safety program. And I've helped, I have that available to my clients as well. I'm partnering with a company called MSME Core, OHS web-based software on the computer, but ultimately deliver it on the phone or the iPad to the worker in the field. Again, license my electrical safety program, customize it, train your staff, and then it can be deployed online. All right, so again, I provide electrical safety programs. Um, I provide arc flash and shock training that's compliant. And again, we can have a free online demonstration of my electrical safety program. So I'm just gonna open up some questions and I noticed there's some questions that are being asked. Uh, I'll just open those up. And it says, where will we find information about arc flash table pasting, posing up to kilowatts? It's mandatory to put arc flash label. Well, there is no mandatory requirement to install a detailed arc flash and shock equipment label. There isn't, right? Um, again, it's, it's the minimum label for North America, the NEC and the CE code, that's it. The, the labels that I showed earlier, it's up to the electrical equipment owner, whether they commission a detailed arc flash and shock study and in turn um, install detailed arc flash and shock labels. It is not mandatory to mark, to mark the arc flash bound on the floor and I don't recommend it, right? Do not mark with the line in front of electrical equipment, the arc flash boundary, because the arc flash boundary is different distance for electrical. You'll have yellow lines going everywhere, right? Do not do that. The arc flash boundary only exists related to a work task, right? Related to a work task. And again, doing electrical has identification against the work task, abnormal arcing fault, because the voltage is high enough, three phase, there's enough available fault current and it'll be sustained and then it'll convert to an arc flash. It says, why 75 cal uh, in a 60, in 50, 75, 56 cal hazard? Why not 60? So again, different vendors of arc flash shoots will have different ATPVs of their arc flash shoots. There's probably, I don't know, eight or nine vendors for North America that have arc flash shoots. And initially they were, most of them were marketing to the 40 cal myth. And that's changed, right? So 40, 51, uh, 65, 76, 80 is readily available now. I determined 75 for several reasons in the past while. And the other thing in Z462 is we added an arc flash PP category five to the table method because when you use the new formulas for low voltage switch gear, it achieves a 73 calorie calculation. So we have an arc flash PP category five in Z462 of a minimum 75 calories per centimeter squared ATV arc flash suit. All right, so it was a readily available arc flash suit ATVV was 60 to 80 from multiple vendors. And again, that's why I've sort of 75 sort of where I start. And I'm starting to recommend that clients go to 100 because the 100 cal suit, the wearability of it, the total layering and the total weight and the heat that uh, that's generated is more reasonable than old 40 cal suits, old 40 cal suits. Racking it out. So racking it out a power circuit breaker requires arc flash PP, low or high voltage, right? So because we have the probability of, again, the fingers coming off and then an abnormal arcing fault occurring as the breaker is being racked out. No shock hazard, only arc flash for racking it out power circuit breakers. Uh, the category method uh, for selecting arc flash clothing. So the arc flash PP category method, the existing table in 7E and Z462 are an easy way to make some quick decisions and they were never intended to be complicated to get arc flash PP on workers. I'll make a statement, two eight volt three phase, 45 kVA transformer sourcing that panel board or higher where a minimum 8.0 calorie per centimeter squared ATV full body arc flash PP for a work task that could create an abnormal arcing fault, right? So there's the starting point. Two eight volt three phase voltage measurements as an example or higher right, minimum eight calorie, and then use the category method, the arc flash PP category method to determine if you need a category four, depending on the parameters that are in the table, if you don't have an energy analysis available to you, but minimum eight calorie would be the starting point and then decide if you need an arc flash suit. And I define two arc rated clothing levels in an electrical safety program. Level one is minimum eight and level two is minimum 75 calories. And there was a table again added in 70E and Z462 in recent editions that when instant energy calculations are performed, two are created clothing levels, 1.2 to 12, and then greater than 12. But you don't want to just go to a 25 color flash suit, 
You want to go up to an ATPV that's now a higher value, as I'm indicating at 75. And then if you do commission a study, balance again incident energy to substitution and engineering safety by design options for incident energy reduction, right? Money doesn't grow on trees. And when you do a risk assessment, you balance PPE with the technical capability and the feasibility to drive, drive down that incident energy level. I'm not discounting doing it, but you have to do a cost benefit analysis. And when you do a risk assessment, you're gonna trade off, right? That cost benefit to, again, the fact that you will need some form of arc flash PP and the wearability and the protection of a 75 calorie point zero arc flash suit is the same as full body clothing that might be, you know, 8.7 shirt, 14 pants, 17 cal shield and Bella Clava, right? So. Again, just again, I, I could go on about PP for quite some time. Uh, rather than rather wear nine calorie than twenty five. Um, rather wear nine calorie clothing that at than a twenty five. I that one's confusing. I'm not sure on that question. Uh, rubber insulating mats is not mandatory either. In fact, I don't recommend rubber insulating mats because they get damaged as soon as you step on them. Again, rubber insulating mat is a third level shock PP. The first priority is rubber insulating gloves and leather protectors. This should be what's on every electrical worker's hands if their hands are gonna go into a box with exposed conductors and circuit parts. This is the primary method of current flow into the body is through the worker's hands. Ohm rated or EH rated boots are worn and then a rubber insulating mat in, stand, in front of switch gear I think is, is a waste of money. I would invest my money somewhere else, right? And if you do have rubber insulating mat, you should have a. 10 foot section rolled up in a canister that's kept clean and put out, you know, when the worker's doing work on the electrical equipment. So rubber insulating mats, I don't think they, they are, are really of any value. And then you have to send those mats out for dielectric testing, which when I've seen them, they're never sent out for testing either. I've referenced uh, NFPA 70 and ZCSA should contractors cross reference more than one of the above or use the, so in Canada, you will use Z462. In the US, you will use NFPA 70E. Some of the divergence, be aware of it. And some of the information in Z462 is valuable. Some of the information in 70 is valuable. So I'd recommend getting both and then using the information that's not in the other standard. So we have some annexes that are really good. In fact, we have three or four or five annexes now in Z462 that aren't in 70E and some new high voltage annexes related to switching and isolation and temporary protected grounds that are not in 70E. 70 has an entire annex on capacitors, right? That we don't have in Z462. So the annex is where there is a lot of divergence in content and then this new arc flash PP category table, but I would recommend that, yeah, you could purchase both and then use information from both that might be missing from the other, right? Both 70E and Z462 are not adopted into OHS law in Canada or the US. So they're voluntary standards. They always have been, right? So I recommend standards of tools. Get as many standards as you can on a topic and use the information from them, right? As you see fit in your company, like electrical equipment maintenance, NFPA 70B, CSA Z463, ANSI NIDA maintenance test standard. Three valuable electrical equipment standards for Canada. Get them all. Use the information in your electrical equipment maintenance program. In your experience research, what's the most common work task which leads to an arc flash? Again, the most common performed work task would be voltage measurements. So interacting, but statistically, I have not seen anything that says, you know, this is the, the incidents that have occurred for arc flash and, and the work tasks that were being performed, right? So again, there is a couple of, of arc flash incidents that are, are out there and there's a couple of individuals that do speaking. Again, I think pulling, you know, another one that, that that's prevalent in my mind is, you know, installing, conductors energized right into panels right so that one i've heard of a couple of times so i'd say energized repair and alteration is at the top of the list where conductors are being pulled in energized and we get a conductor right and coming into energized conductors creating an abnormal arcing fault and then probably after that i'd say interaction voltage measurement but i think mostly probably repair and alteration related is where i've heard of it remember there isn't a lot of arc flashes that are occurring that are public knowledge or statistically reported, right? So again, that's a good question, but I, I again, I just haven't seen that in my travels, right? Uh, let's see here. Nice to see you to encourage to shine light on the subject. Possibly that CSA could be too prescriptive and therefore be adding to the confusion. So 
the question said, you know, says thanks for this presentation and, and talking about this topic of myths and misinformation. 70E and Z462 are prescriptive, and that's fine, but it still comes down to my opinion of interpretation, right? So, you know, if you strictly go, well, that's what it says. Well, you gotta, you gotta like any standard, you gotta read it and read through it. And then, and depending on what it is, this is what we're going to do at our company because we don't believe that arc flash PP is required for opening a hinge door, or we're going to clarify what electrical equipment hinge doors would require arc flash PP to warn. Just not accept that all hinge doors because it's it's not true. It's not it's not it's not true, right? Um, so it says, what would you recommend um, when we turn on the equipment for the very first time over a certain app switch gear? So a new work task was added to 7E table 130.5C and Z462 table two that says on first energization, right? In commissioning or after significant maintenance, like so a power circuit breaker is removed and detailed maintenance is performed on it and it's returned, sorry, rack back in and, and you close it. So it's recommending in that table that the like of occurrence of an abnormal arcing fault is yes, and arc flash PP would require it. So this would predominantly be electrical contractors um, on greenfield construction sites or maintenance and testing contractors. So again, it recommends it. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll buy that one. But after that, we place that breaker back into normal service and we do not need arc flash and shock PP to operate those circuit breakers or disconnect switches Again, as long as we have normal equipment conditions after that. I'm trying to balance this out using risk assessment as a tool, and it is a very powerful tool. Do we keep your operating mains? No, well, main breakers, same thing. Operating a main breaker or a branch circuit breaker disconnect switch, do a risk assessment for your specific electrical equipment. Again, yes, take condition of maintenance in consideration, but if you've got normal equipment conditions, no arc flash speed operate, but what's proliferated, and I hate the name of the product called a chicken switch, is fear-based marketing again. And it's overwhelming industry. And again, electrical workers have switched electrical equipment energized for since we invented it, right? And statistically, I don't even know if I've ever seen any stats that would be even credible about operating electrical equipment and having abnormal arc and fall, arc flash and arc flash occurred. Probably yes, but like one in how many hundreds of millions of operations Right. So again, we're conservatively saying if we've got one in uh, 500 million operations and then we're going to put our flash PP on to operate, it just it doesn't stand up in, a, in, a, in my opinion, in a risk assessment. All right. So um, one fatality a year from our flash, though it's not as high as many are stating, many fatalities are not categorized correctly due to the fact that the COD is days and weeks rather than the, later in the burn unit for infection, organ failure. So Again, I stated that I, you know, based on that NFPA 70 electrical incidents report that I read through it, that there might be one arc flash fatality a year, right? So it's the fatality. There's arc flash burns occurring, but definitely not at the frequency of shocks, right? So and shocks aren't reported. There's hundreds of thousands of shocks in the US not reported. The ones that are reported electrocutions. And so we see this 99% of fatalities of electrocutions and 1% as arc flash burn fatalities where the worker doesn't survive the burn injuries. To me, that's facts, right? That just, you don't, you just don't see arc flashes out there. It, we, would, we would see more evidence of it because the burns, you can't hide them. But for shock, it's an invisible injury, right? So again, statistically, abnormal arcing faults are occurring, but not at the rate that shocks have been and are still occurring, right? Okay, so um, I open main door as kind of hinge cover, but we have plexiglass cover over main bus bar and breaker. So again, adequate guarding, finger safe and insulation. There's no inadvertent movement risk for shock. If you're opening up a door and you know that there's adequate insulation guarding and finger safe, there's inherently no shock hazard because it's an inadvertent movement risk. And opening hinge door is not gonna cause an abnormal arcing fault, right? Again, I just, I just don't see this as something that's credible, but it's in the standard and I'm hearing it. Just like, again, full arc flash people to operate. Um, it's, it's opening hinge doors. These are tasks that I tell employers, do your own risk assessment, right? And make a decision. But I support that operating energized electrical equipment doesn't require arc flash PP. You don't have to buy all this expensive remote switching equipment, right? And again, and I just, I just mentioned the fact that a vendor calls their product a chicken switch, I just think is 
you know, I've always told them that I think that's not, that's not the right way to market a product, instilling fear with the client, right? So, all right, and I'm just going to bring things to a close. We're a little bit over here, right? So we're a little bit over. Um, um, let's see here. Um, uh, I'm just, again, one of the questions is not clear to me uh, with respect to what it's saying related to risk assessment, but the risk assessment tool, again, that I use, it's a qualitative risk assessment. It's compliant to, again, risk assessment standards uh, with respect to electrical hazard identification and risk assessment. I've got a three by three matrix. I broke down um, the potential severity of injured damage to health, to shock and arc flash into three severity levels. I put three likelihood levels. Uh, again, for likelihood, predominantly qualifications and competency of the worker, human performance and condition of maintenance of the electrical equipment are the determining factors for like, like of occurrence. And you just have to manage that you don't conservatively interpret condition of maintenance. All right, so we've got to have a balance to this. We've got to get rid of these arc flash myths and misinformation. We've got to place more emphasis on the shock hazard and we got to get sequela, you know, knowledge of sequela with employers and specifically electrical workers that have been shocked multiple times so that they're aware of and they manage those long-term effects of shock. All right, so I'm gonna bring the webinar to a close. I appreciate everybody attending today. Um, again, and, and I look forward to having another webinar. So watch on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm probably gonna to move to having webinars possibly every two months and we'll pull for topics. But again, I appreciate everybody attending today. And again, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can get back to me directly with my email address or my phone. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn and my website has a blog and publications. I regularly post articles for Electrical Line Magazine and some other, uh, some other publications as well. So take care and have a great day. Thank you everybody for attending.